First Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, Father in heaven. God, we thank you for today, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the God, that you are the God who speaks, and that you speak to us through your word, making your will known to us, sanctifying us, transforming us, and saving us from our sins. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. We thank you, God, for who you are, and ask that you'd bless our time this evening, and that you'd give me an ability to speak clearly, and that your people might be blessed. Be with us now, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it was in the early 1700s that you found yourselves in the New World, in America, where there was a range of, oh, excuse me, where there was a range of uh, gospel preaching that was taking place at the time. Uh, uh, preachers who were preaching a good message of salvation to people, talking about their sin and their need for a saviour, uh, among whom was Jonathan Edwards. Uh, and uh, during this period of time, we know as the historical period of the Great Awakening, because people began to come to faith, and not just in mediocre terms or mediocre ways, but in radical ways. They found themselves weeping and giving up alcohol and stopping adultery, and the pews started to be filled. And then something happened, something changed, where a lot of these people who had these seemingly divine experiences found themselves turning back. They found themselves turning back to their old ways, leaving the church and um, doing the very same things that they wanted to do. And so it raised a number of questions for the preachers and the pastors and the scholars of the day, the Bible scholars. What was then the place of affections if we're going to see this? And for one of the persons who, who saw this, they thought that there is no place for religious affections in the Christian life. Then for others, they said, no, no, they, they still are all Christians, and religious affections is the heart and substance of everything that we do in life. And then you had Jonathan Edwards, who found himself in this historical moment who blessed the church, and that's what caused him to write the book Religious Affections. And it's a blessing to the church because it helps us understand what is the place of affections in the Christian life. And what he, the way that he unpacked this book is he's, he explained that there were some signs that you would see um, in Christians, but they weren't exclusive to Christians. You, you could also see them in people who would depart from the faith. You could see them in other religions. And so he talked about things like repentance. That repentance is definitely a sign of a Christian, but it's not an exclusive sign of a Christian because there's other people who display repentance in the same way there's other people who display weeping and there's other people who, who give up their sinful lives. But it's not exclusive to Christians because we see it in the world. We see people who are coming to Jesus and, and falling away. And then he gets to the second part of his book where he starts to talk about signs that are exclusive to Christians. And it, by way of my, my way of boiling it down might put it like this. The sign of someone that is exclusive to a Christian is that they have come to Christ based on his loveliness. They see Jesus for who he is as the savior and redeemer of all, and they come to him, come to a relationship with him. They want to be forgiven of their sins because they ultimately want a relationship with God. And it's this, it's this sign that is the sign that lasts that pulls us towards who Jesus is. You see, what we treasure ultimately transforms us. What we treasure changes who we are. It pulls us towards that very thing that we treasure. Jesus says this when he gave the parable of the priceless pearl, talking about the kingdom of God, that there's someone who came to understand just how priceless this thing is, and he gave up every single thing in his life in order to have this pearl. His treasure transformed him to want this and only this. Jesus also gives us this teaching on the Sermon on the Mount when he talks about where we store our things, what we are working for. And he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And if your treasure is for Christ, if your treasure is the kingdom of God, then that is the place that you are going to be putting your finances. What we treasure transforms us and it reflects who we are. Now we find ourselves in this series, uh, beginning this series in Paul's first letter to Timothy. 
So before we get into it, who, who was Timothy? Well, Timothy was someone who was... Um, uh, actually, sorry, before getting into that, Paul was someone who was appointed as an apostle to the Gentiles. Paul found himself as, as a, a, a Jewish man, a, a religious leader, who scoffed at Christians. He came to a saving faith in Christ, was sent to commission, uh, commission to preach to the Gentiles. And on one of his journeys, he came across Timothy. And not only did he meet him, but he recruited him to be part of his missionary journeys. And eventually, he came to trust Timothy enough that Timothy could begin to be a leader in one of the churches that he had appointed, in particular one in Ephesus, to be able to help guide that church. Now, the situation that Timothy finds himself in Ephesus is that something is not quite right in the church. You know, and, and it, it's never explicitly stated what is not quite right as, as you go through the letter. Maybe, maybe it was that there was just no growth. Maybe it was something else. Something that we can definitely say that it was not is that there was, there was an internal rot that was happening. What began to become clear was that the church did not look like it ought to have been. It, it found itself in a weird situation where it was filled with false teaching, where men found themselves arguing and quarreling about theological issues, where women were seeking to usurp the authority within the church. And then there was just a general unsureness of who should lead and how we're to take care of particular people within the church. And in this letter to Timothy, in chapter 3, verses 14 to 16, Paul gives us the reason for why he wrote this letter. He says, I write these things to you, hoping to come to you soon. But if I should be delayed, I have written so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. In other words, this is about behavior. The church is the household of the living God, and, and the church ought to know how to conduct themselves because they are the pillar and foundation of the truth. And that takes us to our very title for this entire series, which is Godliness in the House of God. This is what it's dealing with, godliness in the house of God. And because of this situation, because there's this internal rot that's happening through dissensions and false teachings and things like that, what Paul seeks to do, first of all, is establish among, for Timothy a public authority, an authority that is recognized amongst the church. This is how he begins his letter in verses 1 to 2 of chapter 1. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, Paul has said, Timothy is my true son in the faith. And he establishes who, who Timothy is. But notice then, if you were to jump to the very end of this letter, in chapter 6, verse 21, he concludes by saying, grace be with you all. In other words, when this letter was written, it was written to Timothy, but there's a sense to which that as Timothy was reading this letter, the whole church found themselves staring over his shoulders. They were supposed to be listening to what Paul was telling Timothy. Paul was establishing amongst that church Timothy's public authority. It was a public authority that was to be recognized by the leaders and the laity, by those who were teachers, elders, and deacons, by those who were men, women, older men, younger women, by everyone. And what Paul starts to do as this letter unfolds is he gives Timothy a series of charges for how to bring that church back to where it ought to be, how to heal itself from that internal rot that is taking place. And the way that he does this as we look through the letters, he first of all raises a gospel issue. And then he moves to a set of instructions that he gives to the church. He then raises another gospel issue. And then he gives another set of instructions to the church. And then he concludes his letter by raising another gospel issue. In other words, what he gives is, is a teaching about a, a false doctrine and its remedy. And then follows that with how we should live. Because... The plain reality, brothers and sisters, is that what we treasure is how we are transformed. And Paul sees that pattern. And if the church is going to receive the instructions that it needs to receive, it needs to hear the gospel first. And so the main point of our first 
talk, our first sermon, but also the main point of that book is this. Treasure the gospel for all it is and see God who transforms us for all we are. Treasure the gospel for all it is and see God who transforms us for all we are. Now, the main point of our sermon tonight is that we've only covered the first two verses and and so there's a whole book to uncover. But before looking at the parts, the individual parts, the point of our time this evening is to have a look at the whole, to take a bird's eye view of the book of Timothy and see how various points or what Paul is doing that is unfolding so that when we launch into the rest of the passages, we see how it all fits together. And so by way of understanding how the the sermon is going to look like is that first of all, we're going to see what the gospel issues are that Paul addresses, and then we're going to see the instructions that he gives the church. And if if I can just make this a little bit fun for you, uh, and importantly, um, uh, followable, or something that is, is more informative, please have your Bibles open. Let's open the scriptures, flip around together as we look at the verses that Paul gives us. So first, treasure the gospel. This is the first thing that we have to understand about the the main point of the book. So what were the gospel issues that were going on? Well, Paul says this in verses 3 to 4 of chapter 1. He says, As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach false doctrine or to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. These promote empty speculations rather than God's plan which operates by faith. He then says in chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, he says, Now the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons, through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared. They forbid marriage and demand abstinence from foods that God created to be received with gratitude by those who believe and know the truth. And then the final gospel issue we find in chapter 6, in verses 3 to 5, and he says this, If anyone teaches false doctrine and does not agree with the sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching that promotes godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but has an unhealthy interest in disputes and arguments over over words. From these come envy, quarreling, slander, evil suspicions, and constant disagreement among people whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth, who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain. In other words, that first part in chapter 1, what he says is that one of the gospel issues is that there are people who are consumed by pride. For some of them, The gospel is quickly left behind, and and the Bible is just a mystery to be solved. It's just a book to be mastered. We just have to understand every theological nuance. It's not a book that is supposed to master you, but something that you are supposed to master. It's not something where God's word stands over you, but you, you with your theological constructs stand over the word of God. And what ends up happening is that there are arguments as I am more interested in proving my rightness of how I put the Bible together than understanding of what God's plan is for me. And the particular controversy here is about the law. But then we go into the second controversy, the second gospel issue, which is about power. Because while for some the the Bible is a book to be mastered, for others it is a book to master others. It is a book to require and demand that certain people live in certain ways that is not found in God's word. And the particular controversy that was happening within this church was asceticism, giving up things, giving up things like marriage, giving up things like meat. It was a way to be able to exercise power. And then for others, it was prosperity. It was the gospel came to uh, to people as a means to an end, as something where I can get something from God. And the specific controversy here is not asceticism like he mentioned in chapter 4, but hedonism in chapter 6. The pursuit of wealth, the pursuit of material things constantly. In other words, we find in pride, in power, and in prosperity, 99% of the ways that we can turn the gospel in something to be trifled with rather than something to be treasured. Something that we can make the gospel light of. We make it secondary to our ultimate pursuits in life. See, what we tend to do and what we we can be uh, in danger of doing is we turn the gospel 
into the entry point of the Christian life, that, ah, God has given me salvation, and I have now found myself in the Christian life. But now that I have found myself in the Christian life, it opens me up to bigger and better things. The rest of my journey, the rest of the, where the destination is going, is not Christ himself, but it's other things. Is this something that you find yourself doing? You find yourself often asking, hey, did you know this obscure thing? And then engaging in a theological battle about something that is really obscure, but it's your hobby horse. Maybe you can say that maybe my real interest, my real interest is prophecy. Or my real interest is capitalism and the kingdom of God and the way that God will form his government. Perhaps your interest is endless YouTube discussions or trolling people on internet forums. But if it's not pride, then maybe it's power. Maybe you arrive at the church and say, I'm going to make a beeline towards an eldership. I, I, I want this position. I want to become a pastor. This is my prerogative and my right, and that is what I'm going to take. And if I'm not going to be appointed here, I'm off. And if it's not power, maybe it's prosperity. God bless me. I have come to you. I am seeking good fortunes. That if I honor you, Lord, you will give me a good job. You will bring me wealth. And if not that, you will bring me health. And if not that, you will give me the flourishing life that I'm just looking for because I'm really depressed. And Paul says, treasure the gospel. Paul says that the gospel is far more valuable than your pride, than the power that you seek, or the prosperity that you want. The gospel is the priceless pearl that is worth giving everything up for. You see, the danger of this is that when the gospel is seen as something to be trifled with, when it's that entry point that can be left behind, so is our faith. Because this is how Paul concludes each section in chapter 1, chapter 4, and chapter 6. He says this in chapter 1, verses 18 to 20 on pride. He says, Timothy, my son, I am giving you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies previously made about you, so that by recalling them, you may fight the good fight, having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and have shipwrecked the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered to Satan, so they may, not, so they may be taught not to blaspheme. And then in chapter 4, verse 16, on power, he says, Pay close attention to your life and your teaching. Persevere in these things. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Salvation is on the line, Peter, uh, Timothy. Salvation is on the line. And then in chapter 6, verse 20, on prosperity, he says, Oh, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding irreverent and empty speech and contradictions from what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some people have departed from the faith. What your heart treasures matters. What your heart treasures is what you will be transformed into. And for those who come to the gospel, not treasuring it for itself, will inevitably be transformed and move away from the gospel. And so in light of this, in light of this, we read in 1 Timothy, Paul giving a charge to him to treasure the gospel. But not just for him to treasure the gospel, but for the whole church to treasure the gospel. To preach in such a manner that the church starts to see the loveliness of who Jesus is. And that's why he says in these sections, fight the good faith. Because some have rejected it and have shipwrecked the faith. Pay close attention to your life and your doctrine. Because through that you will save both yourself and your hearers. And guard what has been entrusted to you. Because some people have departed from the faith. So we must treasure the gospel. And when we think about what it means to treasure the gospel naturally, then well, what, what do we think of when we hear that word gospel? See, some uh, particular things can come up when we hear that word gospel. For some of us, we, we tend to find ourselves thinking of the cross and say, gospel, that means the cross. For others, I'd say this is a smaller portion of people, what they think of is the resurrection. When I think of gospel, I think of resurrection. I think of Jesus having died and rose again. And then for others... A larger group of, again, it is all about the return of Christ. It is all about Christ coming back to return, to save his people finally and fully. And the, the danger is, is that when the particular becomes the only, because all of these parts are part of the gospel, 
But when we take one to the exclusion of the others, when we say, sure, these other things are important, but this thing, this thing is at the, the heart of it, where, where we don't even know really what to do with the other things and, and how that is supposed to move our hearts towards worshipping Christ. And when you go through this first letter to Timothy, we are supposed to treasure the gospel for all it is. And then we're supposed to treasure the gospel for all it is because we're supposed to apply the gospel towards all of our life. You see, Paul, when he is responding to these people who are getting in these endless squabbles about the law and what the law is for, when they're seeking to win arguments and starting endless quarreling, this is how he starts to move through that section. He, he says, I give thanks to Christ Jesus our Lord. His whole posture and demeanor changes when he starts to talk about what Christ has done for him. He starts talking about the things that God has done in Christ, those things that are permanent and sealed. And he says this in chapter 1, verse 15. He says, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. In other words, part of the gospel is the cross. The cross is the remedy towards our pride. And Paul has, instead of pride, this humble appreciation of who God is and what God has done for him and says, that law, it was just supposed to drive me to Jesus. And so that frames how his ministry is. He says the goal of ministry is love. It's not endless discussions and quarreling, but love. But then you go further to chapter 4, and there's that issue of asceticism, of giving up marriage and giving up meat. And this was his response to those teachers who were trying to exercise power, those teachers who were trying to impose a certain form of legalism on them. And he begins this in chapter 3, verse 16. And he begins by talking about what God is doing. He says, and most certainly, the mystery of godliness is great. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Now, there are immense discussions about what this passage means. I tend to take them as resurrection realities what God is presently doing, six statements of what God is doing in Christ, of the new world that he has made in Christ. God has started in raising Jesus from the dead, a new creation, and a new people is going to be built by him, where they become new creatures in Christ, and he redeems the whole entire cosmos. Now that Christ has been manifested, or, or literally in the Greek, revealed in the flesh, God raising Christ from the dead in the flesh. He has vindicated his creation. He has proved it good that the very things that he uttered at the beginning of time when he created the heavens and the earth were good and they were worth redeeming and restoring. And that should lead us to embracing the created order. It should lead us to realizing that the things that God has made is good. The world that he has made is something to be embraced. And then finally, we see his response to those who were consumed with material gain, with hedonism, with the pursuit of wealth. And to these teachers in prosperity, he doesn't talk about what God has done or what God is doing, but about what God will do. He says this in chapter, th uh, chapter 6, verse 13 to 14. In the presence of God who gives life to all, and of Christ Jesus, who gave a good confession before Pontius Pilate, I charge you to keep this command without fault or failure until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, what he is talking about is the return of Christ. The gospel is not just about what God has done. The gospel is not just about what God is doing. But the gospel is also about what God will do in Jesus Christ. You see, through the resurrection of Jesus, we kind of live between two worlds. The new world that God is building in Christ, but the old world that has fallen in Adam. It's the now and not yet, but one day. One day the not yet will be now, and it is at the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what that's supposed to be building in us, 
is hope for the world to come. It's the remedy against both asceticism and that, that pursuit of money. Because asceticism denies this created world. And so someone who doesn't understand that God has declared things good in raising Jesus from the dead in the flesh, people who, who don't understand this don't embrace what God has made. But hedonism is the opposite problem that says that all this world is what, what God, uh, this world that is passing away. And so we invest all our hope in this world, all our life in this world. And it's that return of Jesus that says there is hope for a world to come. It gives us that contentment that we need. And so if you can think about how to, um, what this means when we talk about treasuring the gospel for all it is. Those who try for it might say, see the gospel as the car. It's, it's the car that I get into, but I'm going to make it my own way. The problem is when we try to do this and make it our own way, we can easily get lost. We can easily take bumpier roads than we need to. Those who treasure the gospel, they also see it as the map, as the thing that's supposed to actually be guiding me through this life, that he guides all of my life. The thing is, not, it's not just the, the car, it's not just the map, but the gospel is also the fuel. It's the very thing that gets us there, the thing that drives us. See, this series that we uh, have begun, is uh, the title of it is Godliness in the House of God. In other words, it's all about godliness. And, and when you look through the book of Timothy, this word godliness is repeated throughout. And it has us remember why Paul wrote this. He says, like I said, in verses 14 to 16 of chapter 3, he goes, I write these things to you, hoping to come to you soon. But if I should be delayed, I have written so that you will know how... Uh, people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. And what is that behavior? That behavior is godliness, because he continues in verse 16, and most certainly, the mystery of godliness is great. He was manifested in the flesh. Now, when you look into the Greek, that he actually is translated literally as who? Who? And most certainly, the mystery of godliness is great. Who was manifested in the flesh? You see, the mystery of godliness is not some abstract truth. It's not some abstract knowledge that is supposed to be out there. The mystery of godliness is a person. It is Christ. He is the one who has revealed to us what godliness is. And the point is that when you treasure the gospel... You see Christ. When the gospel becomes something that you truly treasure, you see who God truly is in Jesus Christ. The mystery of godliness that was once veiled by sin is now revealed in Christ. So what then is godliness? What is godliness to you? See, if I were to ask you this question, well, what is the opposite of godly? What comes to mind? For most, it can be ungodly. There's a bit of an issue there. Because godliness is, first of all, then defined in moral terms. You see, we've added an extra O, as one pastor said. We've turned godly into goodly. It's a moral term. No, the actual opposite of godly is godless. It's a relational term. It's how I relate to God. A God who is, my pers- who is a person. And this is the thing, is that when we treasure the gospel, brothers and sisters, we come into the intimate experience of a person who is God himself in Christ. And so this is what Paul says when he begins to deal with the proud in chapter 1. He says in verse 16, But I received mercy for this reason, so that in me the worst of them Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. See, for Paul, it wasn't just this abstract proposition, but it was the experience of Christ's patience towards him. Christ did not judge him for his sin, but exercised patience and saved him. And very quickly, 
the remedy of the cross from his pride is something that is turned into humility. And then when he starts to deal with those who are hungry for power, he says this in chapter 4, verse 6. He goes, if you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, nourished by the words of the faith and the good teaching that you have followed. In other words, in coming to Jesus Christ and seeing him taken up in glory, the exalted Jesus Christ, he had a true experience of Christ's exaltation. And very quickly, the remedy to that power hungriness and seeing the resurrected Christ leads to servanthood. I am just a servant. And if this is the way that God has appointed me in his household, then let it be like that. But if this is the way that he has appointed me in his household, then let it be like that. You come to a person. And then dealing with those who are so focused and consumed with prosperity. He says this in verses 18 to 19 of chapter 6. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of what is truly life. You see, in coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul experienced what is truly life. He no longer placed hope in this fleeting life, but he placed his hope in the life to come. And that's why he could begin this letter by calling Jesus Christ our hope. And very quickly, that discontentment with the material things of this world that we pursue is formed into a divine contentment. I have everything that I need because there is a far greater hope that awaits me so that I can become fixed and concerned with the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I am enamored by Christ. I'm smitten by him. I see his loveliness. And it's in this context, brothers and sisters, it's in this context where Paul talks about who Jesus truly is as the lovely Lord and Savior, that the church can be ready to receive instruction. It's in this context where the gospel is truly treasured that a church and a people can truly be transformed. But transformed into what? What are we supposed to be transformed into? What are the, instru- <clears throat> the instructions that we're supposed to hear? Again, remember that this is about godliness in the house of God, in God's household. That's what Paul says when he writes the reason why he wrote this. He goes, but if I should be delayed, I have written so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. In other words, we're talking about a family, a family whose bonds are stronger than natural blood because we are bound by the blood of Christ. Now, in any kind of family, there are certain maxims or expectations One that I like that uh, Roy has shared is the boy goes down so the girl goes free. It's a maxim. It's an expectation of this is what our household is going to look like. And for different families, there's going to be different expectations. Different families, there's going to be different rules, different ways that people should conduct themselves within their family. So what about the household of God? What about when there's certain maxims or instructions that are given? Are these just simply random instructions? What, if, what about self-authoritating? Just to control people more, a dictatorship kind of instructions. What about if the instructions are just contextual? Because that, that is one of the questions we will have to ask when we enter into chapter 2. Are there contextual discu- uh, uh, instructions? That this was happening, and so this is why Paul was doing that. Or was it something else? And this takes us to the final part of our main point, which is that we treasure the gospel for all it is and see God who transforms us to what we were meant for, who transforms us for all we are. See, brothers and sisters, we find ourselves living in a world where sin has disordered this world completely. For example, men 
rather than using their strength for virtuous purposes and channeling that courage and bravery for virtuous purposes, have misused their God-given strength. Women, likewise, have, have misused their, their certain qualities to usurp men's leadership. That, that is what was happening in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. And then when we see history unfold, what we see is that rulers, rather than ruling in selflessness and justice and righteousness, found themselves ruling in selfishness and injustice and unrighteousness. And then we see a society that indulges in godlessness. The issues of idolatry, of injustice and immorality. And in the gospel, what we see is this, is that Christ's redemption does not undo creation, but it undoes the fall. What Christ is doing, what God is doing in Christ, is restoring what was lost because of sin. He is vindicating the good order of creation, but also showing how it was meant to be. And the reason why this is so important as we look through this letter in Timothy is that these instructions are not random, but restorative. These instructions flow from what the gospel does and from what the gospel is wanting to do. Where government was instituted by God as a, um, to, to form societies that would pursue godliness. Where men found themselves using their strength, not for independence, but for dependence, to become beggars before a holy God seeking Him. Where women would use exercise self-control so that they could submit to men. And where leaders would embody godliness where they would be selfless in their actions and promote justice and what is good. And so when we look in chapters 2 to 3, what we see is this, is that the gospel restores the creational order. The gospel moves us towards what God was wanting in the very beginning. That's why he's going to tell us that we need to be praying for governments. It's why he's going to be telling us that men should be lifting holy hands before God as beggars rather than argumentative that's why he says that women should adorn themselves in good works, which is most clearly seen in self-control, not to usurp, but to learn. And then again, this instruction is not random. Because when we also uh, understand what sin has done, it hasn't just created a world of disorder, but it's also created a world of dishonor. Where younger men dishonor younger women because they lack the purity in their mind. The family and the church have found themselves disordering, dishonoring widows, lacking to give them the proper care that widows who deserve a certain care should get. Pastors being unpaid workers, slaves being grumbling workers. In other words, there's all kinds of issues that are going on in the church where there's dishonor. And in the gospel, what we have to understand is that Christ restores what was lost. And so instructions are not random, but they're restorative. And what is Christ is doing is restoring honor as it was meant to be. Like I said, these instructions, they're not random, they're restorative restoring honor to younger women and to the whole household of God, but also restoring honor to widows deserve to be cared for, restoring honor to pastors who deserve double honor, and restoring honor to masters who deserve all honor. See, brothers and sisters, the household of God is supposed to show the world what life was made to be. It's supposed to transform all of we, who we are. It's supposed to re restore us, it's supposed to restore our family, and it's supposed to restore our church. So to close our time, I want to just close by reading our text in verses 1 to 2 again. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Does that grace, mercy, and peace feel personal? Is that grace and mercy redemptive for you? Is that peace, is that shalom restorative for you in Christ?
brothers and sisters, Paul's letter to Timothy tells us that we must treasure the gospel for all it is and see God who transforms us for all we are. This is a book that tells us we need to be enamored by Christ, be smitten by Him. And then once that happens, say, show me, Lord, the way that you made me to live. Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, we thank you for this letter that Paul has written to Timothy. God, we thank you that you have not called us towards living a moral life first, but to being in right relationship with you. And we thank you that you have revealed yourself in Christ Jesus so that we can see how lovely you are. Help us, Lord, to say how high when you say jump. Help us to be that in love with you. Help us to follow your way and trust that it is the path to life. God, we praise you and we thank you in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen.